Hello, and welcome to worship with First United Church of Oak Park. Whoever you are and whatever has brought you to this sacred time of worship with us, know that we're glad you're here. And we welcome you wholeheartedly for the whole person that you are. No matter who you love, how you identify, or what your body may look like, we welcome you as a beloved child of God and are fully welcomed into the life of our church community. Whenever you may be worshiping, we would love to know that you're here. So please take a moment to do that with our virtual pew pad, the link to which can be found in the live chat. If you are new to our community, this is a great place to ask any questions that you might have about our church, as well as an additional place to share any prayers that you have brought with you today. And other than in the live chat, if you are here on Sunday morning, I invite you to continue to prepare your heart and mind for this time of worship together. Take a deep breath. Close your eyes if that feels comfortable to you, but take another breath. And as you breathe in, may you breathe in peace. Let its warmth fill your lungs and your belly. Let that peace spread throughout your body, all the way down to your toes. Let it sink into you as you sink into it. Even if there is chaos swirling around you, take this one moment to take a breath and let the peace it brings settle your mind, your heart, your body. You are God's beloved child, called blessed and gifted the peace of Christ. Now you are ready ready to move further into this space with this community, ready to share God's peace with others. Please take a moment to do that today or in the next few moments with a text, in the live chat, maybe a phone call, or share a hug with someone sitting next to you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Surround us. 
Will you please join me in a posture of prayer? A prayer for when we've lost our way again by Enuma Okoro. Merciful God, sometimes it seems like we can't help but lose our way again and again. Our hearts long to follow you, but you know the way of the human heart. You know how in our misguided longings we veer off our journeying to you and begin to chart our own ways by false stars and distorted visions. Forgive us. Forgive us when we forget that we are already claimed by you, loved by you, and purposed for you. Forgive us when we allow ourselves to shape and be shaped by voices and words that do not bring life, create life, nurture life, sustain life, or resurrect life. Merciful God, help us find our way again. Turn us back towards the road, spotted with your other pilgrims, wayfarers, and repentant servants. Remind us that your way is the way of returning. Guide us by your spirit and by your light. Let us remember the power of the spirit within us. Make us remember the gifts of our minds, our hearts, and our bodies that you have bestowed on us, that we would use them to honor the directives and the invitations you lay upon us. We know that our ways are not your ways, and we thank you for this. Help us trust your ways over our ways. Remind us of the faithfulness as you forgive us our short memory. In your immeasurable love, grace, mercy, and wisdom, do not abandon us regardless of how often we lose our way. Place your wounded hands upon our broken hearts and turn us towards you. friends. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. God claims you and loves you each and every day for the person you are. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi children, I have a story for you and it's a big story. So let me go and get ready. Let's begin. This is the Sea of Galilee. So many important things happened by the sea. The sea is a wonderful and strange place. When the wind blows, the sea becomes very rough and wild. But when the wind is calm, the sea is peaceful and still. Once, Jesus was standing by the sea 
and people had followed him. They wanted to hear him talk about how much God loved them and about God's dream for their world. There were also some fishermen near the shore. They had been fishing and now they were washing up, cleaning their nets. Jesus went over and got in the boat that belonged to Simon. He asked Simon to take him out into the water. And Jesus started teaching the crowd from the boat. After he was done teaching, Jesus said to Simon, put your net out into the deep, dark water. Simon said to Jesus, we were just fishing all night long and we caught nothing. But if you want us to, we will put our nets out. And so Simon and the other fishermen put the nets out into the deep, dark water. To their surprise, there were so many fish in the net when they brought it up that the net could barely hold them. Simon had to have help getting all of these fish up into the boat. brought their catch back to the shore. And they got out of the boat. Simon said to Jesus, I don't deserve to spend time with you. You are good and I am not Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will follow me and we will catch more than fish. We will fish for people. What a strange thing to say. But Simon and the other fishermen left everything behind to go and follow Jesus. Now, I wonder which part of this story is your favorite part. I wonder what the fishermen felt like when they had been fishing all night long and they had caught nothing. I wonder if you have ever felt like Simon like 
you weren't good enough. I wonder how the people felt watching all of this. I wonder what happened with all of the fish. Pastor John is going to read this story to us now. Let's keep wondering about it. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. May God bless us with understanding. Would you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth in the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus was teaching. He was teaching a great big crowd of people. Nothing unusual in that. After all, Jesus' fame was spreading throughout Galilee even very early on in his ministry. However, as our passage begins today, Jesus is really just a, a one-man show. He is a solitary figure, traveling from place to place to place, teaching about the realm of God, healing those who were sick. He was a solitary figure. There were no disciples yet until this day, Anyway, it begins on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The locals call it the Lake of Gennesaret because it is a lake. Fresh water filled with a great deal of fish. There were towns all around Lake Gennesaret with a mixture of all sorts of people. Jews and Gentiles, foreigners, as well as locals. There were traders there sometimes from far away countries, there to purchase a kind of a fish sauce that was the basic table condiment for every meal, the table salt of its day. It was an interesting place, like Gennesaret, busy, full of activity, people coming and going. And it is in that varied and diverse community, that bustling kind of place, that is where Jesus has gathered a crowd and he is teaching. They are eager to hear. So eager, in fact, that the crowd is pressing in on him too closely and he needed some space just so that everyone could hear him. 
So he asks a fisherman who was nearby, Simon, Peter we call him now, but at that moment he was just some person, some bystander. Jesus asks him to row his boat out into the water a bit to get some distance. Jesus approached him, not because he was listening. In fact, Peter had not been a part of the crowd who was there to listen to Jesus. He had been fishing. He was there in his boat, cleaning and mending his nets, preparing to dry and fold the nets. This was just a daily chore that you needed to do at the end of a working day if you were a fisherman. Peter hadn't been there to listen to Jesus at all. But Jesus asked him to, and Peter agreed to row Jesus out a ways into the shallows of the lake. And from his boat, Jesus taught the crowd. When he was finished teaching, Jesus turned to Peter and told him to to row a ways, to go out from the shallows, to go out into the deep water, and there to let his nets down into the lake. Now, Peter objects, first, because it's inconvenient. He would have to begin all over again this day's chores of cleaning and drying and folding and mending the nets. He had just been doing that. He has to start all over. It's inconvenient. Second, Peter says, it would be pointless. They had fished all night and had caught nothing, not one fish. Peter and his partners, James and John, they had done their utmost, and it had been fruitless. But Jesus insists, let down your nets. So perhaps reluctantly, Peter lowers the nets down into the lake. And when he begins to pull it back up again, he feels, he feels fish so many fish that he can't lift them on his own. It's beginning to tear the nets. Now, in my imagination, Jesus offers to help him, perhaps with a little smile in his eyes. Oh, oh, you, you got something, do you? Jesus is a young man. He's strong. He has the arms of a manual laborer because he was a manual laborer. They haul on the nets, and they are so filled with every kind of fish that was in the lake tilapia and sardines and catfish, so many fish that the boat is beginning to capsize. And Peter calls for his partners, James and John, to row out in their boat to help too. And it takes all four of them hauling on the nets to fill to fill the boats up with fish. So many fish did they catch that it fills both up completely and the boats are almost sinking there so full. Now, these are not small fishing boats either. Each one could easily hold a thousand pounds of fish. They rowed back to shore, carrying these two boats, perhaps together a literal ton of fish, perhaps 2,000 pounds of fish, back to this incredulous crowd who must be wondering, what is happening here? what, What happens next? It's well known. Peter and James and John, they become the very first disciples of Jesus. That inimitable line, from now on, you will be fishing for people. And they do. These three fishermen, they leave everything behind. Their boats, their nets, their businesses. When Jesus walks away from the shore, they leave everything behind and never come back. And thus begins the story of the disciples. But that leaves me with one burning question. What happened to all those fish? What happens to all the fish? Remember, this is a lot of fish, a ton of fish, quite literally. And the crowd who watched this miraculous catch of fish be brought into shore, they also subsequently watched the owners of those fish just walk away, never 
to return. So what happened to all the fish? Well, the crowd would have divided it up. They would have divided up the miraculous catch of fish and taken them home to eat them or to the market to sell them or to the fish sauce makers to make fish sauce with them. This crowd of people, they knew the value of fish. They knew what to do with a ton of fish. They wouldn't have left it there to rot. The crowd would have divided it up. The story of the call of the first disciples here also is a sneaky second story, too. It is the story of miraculously feeding a multitude. It is the story of the fishermen who hadn't caught a fish all night, instead ending up with enough fish to feed the whole town and for free. The story of the call of the first disciples. It is a story about the whole community being awash in overflowing blessings, ordinary, embodied, wonderful, overflowing blessings. The story of the call of the first disciples is a story about the whole community being blessed, overflowing blessings, ordinary, embodied, wonderful blessings for the whole community. That is what Christian discipleship is like. This is the story of the call of the first disciples. This is what tells us what Christian discipleship is like. And I love this passage. I love the story of the call of the first disciples because I see in it two crucial lessons that still define discipleship to this day. The first is that discipleship is about following Jesus as who you are as the person you are, the life you do lead, the skills you really do have, not as someone else. Peter and James and John, they are fishermen. So what does Jesus tell them? From now on, you'll be fishing for people. Discipleship is about following Jesus as who you are, turning all of yourself over to the service of the way of Jesus. The second lesson is more of a, a test or a verification of the first. Okay, so say that I've turned my whole self over to the way of Christ. How do I know that it's, you know, working? How do I know if I'm doing it right? How do I know if I'm really being a disciple of Jesus? Well, you'll know when what you do leads to overflowing blessings overflowing blessings for the whole community. Now, this might feel daunting. How am I supposed to do something that blesses the whole community? I can barely keep my household together, and I have been fishing all night, not one fish. It's easier than it seems to bless the whole community, and it sneaks up on you. It does the good that you can do for your whole community. In the face of neighbors all around struggling to afford food. Being a disciple of Jesus can be volunteering just a few hours a month at the food pantry. And all of a sudden, thousands of families are supported each month by the food pantry. Tons of food. In the face of a world driven to the corners of isolation, being a disciple of Christ can be writing pal notes a few weeks out of the year. And all of a sudden, people who are mourning have their prayers lifted up across the country. People recovering from surgery have casseroles dropped off at their doors. The heartbroken know that they are not alone. In a nation struggling with youth depression and mental health crises among children compounded by the pandemic, Christian discipleship can be serving as a friend in faith for our Quest program, or as a Fuji or Fush advisor, or a Sunday school teacher. And all of a sudden, the young people of Oak Park can see that there is a whole community that loves them and cares what happens to them. 
a whole community that knows that their worth isn't measured by GPA and that who they are is a gift who knows that by virtue of their baptism, they are invested with a holy calling as a disciple of Christ, Christian discipleship. This is what we are doing here at church. And all of this, what we are doing, it matters deeply to the whole community. When you support the work of the church with your time, with your gifts, with your whole person, when you join into the work of the church, when you set off on the path of discipleship, it is about bringing who you are, who you really are, and you will find that you become a blessing, overflowing to the whole community, nets straining to be able to contain the goodness that comes. The story of the calling of the first disciples, Peter and James and John, who leave it all behind to go follow Jesus. A remarkable story. But wait till you hear about what happened to all the fish. Amen. We will take what you offer. We will live by your word. We will love one another and be led by you, Lord. We will take what you offer. We will live by your word. We will love one another and be led by you, Lord. We will take what you offer. We will live by your word. We will love one another and be led by you, Lord. We will take what you offer. We will live by your word. We will love one another and be led by you, Lord. We will take what you offer. We will live by your word. We will love one another and be led by you, Lord. We will take about sharing our thoughts about First United Church's choral program, we were surprised at first as we haven't been singing actively in the choir since we moved to Plymouth Place in LaGrange Park a couple of years ago. However, on further reflection, we realized that we are at this time, I believe, the longest serving members of the choir. For Hank, almost 50 years, and for me, <laughs> over 35. Where has the time gone? Oh, my goodness. The words to a hymn immediately popped into our heads. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the sweet, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? 
and how, how can, can we keep from singing? Huz, why do you like to sing in the choir? Well, simply the choir is family, uh, and it's, it's a shared task, mm -hmm. and it feels good. Well, I guess my reasons are kind of the same, because it causes me to feel joy, because I feel called to share my talent, well, kind of my mission in the church, and I love the social connections. These are folks we see at least two times a week, sometimes more than we see our own families. Well, what's so special about singing in First United Choir? Mm, I like the view from the loft. <laughs> we can see who's there and who's not. <laughs> and we, we really needed to stay awake. Although that's easy with the current team of ministers. I really miss our choir. Mm -hmm. I miss the challenge of working with others for the shared objective of preparing music for the benefit of others. I miss the blending of words and music, well, supplemented by the organ and other instruments. Oh, and speaking of the organ, it's been great to see and hear Mike Surratt at the Mighty Cassavant on YouTube. And we've been blown away by Bill Chin's mastery of technical skills that have allowed music and, well, everything to continue in our online worship services. And the choir at First United is really special. We have such a dedicated group of music-loving friends, yes, family, who enjoy the process of learning new music of many different styles and eras. Bill sees to that. Plus, we have fun. Yes, indeed we do. Do you remember the monthly after-rehearsal social times with all those homemade goodies? Mm, yes, and do you recall our end-of-the-year choir potlucks at the Zarubas? where folks showed off their special dishes. Well, we're people who not only like to sing, but to eat and drink as well. And let's not forget the summer sings, Sing Me Joyous, singing with other church choirs in an effort to reach other music-loving people in the Chicagoland area. Well, it's all been good, and we're looking forward to being back together soon. Will the COVID epidemic ever end? Mm, I hope so. So let's close with a few lines of another hymn that suits this occasion well. When, when in, in our, our music God, God is glorified and, and adoration, adoration leaves no room, room for pride, pride it, it is as, as though the whole creation cried, Hallelujah! How often making music we have found a new dimension in the world of sound as worship so moved us to a, a more profound, profound Alleluia. So, bye-bye. Hope to see you soon. See you again. Thank you.
gather today in our homes. We gather today in spirit. We gather today across the world with Christians who are celebrating the Lord's Supper today. We gather with Christians across time who have shared this meal for thousands of years. We gather more closely than we know with one another to tell the story again. You are invited to communion, whoever you are, please find at your home, if you haven't already gathered this, please find some bread, find something to drink, find something that you can share with us in the feast together as we remember the story. We remember the story of how Jesus was at table with the disciples. And there he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he offered it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So they took and ate. And after they had eaten, Jesus took a cup. And giving God thanks for it. He blessed it. And gave that to them too, saying, This is my blood. This is a new covenant between God and humanity, a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink from this cup. And remember me. We share in this meal together. We tell this story together. We gather in spirit today. Because we need to. Because of our need to hear of God's gracious love for each of us, there is no end. All are welcome to take communion with us. Whether you are baptized or not, whether you are a member of this church or any church or not, you are welcome to take communion with us. We are taking communion in our homes, that's true. And our spirits reach out to one another, embracing one another. Remembering that wherever people gather, if there are but two or three, if they have gathered in Jesus' name, then the Holy Spirit is there as well. And so we welcome the Holy Spirit into this meal. We welcome you, your presence. If you think that there might be something, though, that separates you from God, something that is more alienating than distance or time, something about you, that means that God would not welcome you. Perhaps it is something that you do not believe that you think you are supposed to. Perhaps it is something that you have done that you would trade the world to take back. Something about you in particular that though God's grace might extend over the whole earth, you feel it would surely pass you by. If that is the kind of distance you are worried about, then remember one last thing about that first last supper. Remember those who were at table with Jesus. There was one there who would doubt Jesus, one there who would deny he had ever met Jesus, one who was waiting only for the dinner to end so that he could betray Jesus to his enemies. And every single one of the others, every single one would abandon Jesus that very night Friends, this has always been a feast of grace. You are welcome. Take, eat, taste, and see how good God is. Holy and loving God, we are grateful that 
you have joined us, that your presence is within us and beside us and among us, gathering us together, binding us together as one body, the body of Christ here in the world. As we gather as one body, then we lift up as one voice our prayers, our joys, our concerns. Listen now, O God, and accept these prayers of your people, offered in our online chat, offered in our spirits, offered before you, O loving God. And as we gather in those prayers, we pray together as in one voice to you, O Mother, creator of all that is, we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Children of the living God, go now from this time of worship. And as you go, may you go loving God so much that you love nothing else too much and fearing God just enough that you need fear nothing else at all. And may the blessings of Almighty God, our Creator Christ, our Brother and Savior, and the upholding of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.